Hello folks uh, and good evening and thanks for joining me with this program. Uh, it is my take on the Missouri story of the Trail of Tears after several years of research. My grandma Hunt, my mother's mother, was born in Lawrence County, Missouri in 1888. She was the daughter of James Madison Keaton and Susan Ruth Ellen Underwood Keaton. This charcoal of my great grandmother hung in the dining room of my grandmother's home in Monette. Missouri until she passed away in 1989 when I got it. As a child I was fascinated by this image. It seemed so unusual. It attracted my attention at every visit to Grandma's house. As an adult the image seemed to demand that I investigate it. Grandma Hunt had explained to me that it was her mother's wedding picture, that she had died at age 37 three days after her apron and dress caught on fire from the cook stove, and that she was a Cherokee. Grandma Hunt named her first child for her. That child was my Aunt Susie, my old maid aunt for 60 years. After retiring from dentistry in 2010, I decided to prove my Cherokee ancestry. Several years of research have proven conclusively that I am not the least bit Cherokee. But in finding the story of great grandma Keaton, her parents, Louisa McGahee and Samuel Young Underwood, and Louisa's sisters, marriages to Cherokee men, all these folks being from Lincoln County, Tennessee, and being the earliest settlers in that portion of Greene County, Missouri, I have been interested in the Cherokee story. None of these folks were involved in the forced removal of the Cherokee Nation on what became known as the Trail of Tears. But I have found in my research that the Trail of Tears story is entwined with early Missouri settlement, another of my interests. So this program is my take on the Missouri story of the Trail of Tears. In 2010, in pursuit of my Cherokee roots, I joined the Trail of Tears Association. It is a volunteer organization in support of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail, shown here across the nine states it runs through. The trail is administered by the Department of the Interior's National Park Service. The Trail of Tears was added to the list of the national trails in 1987. It became one of 31 national trails that are scenic or historic, 21 of which are historic trails. The Congressional Act that created the system states that its purpose is to, quote, promote the preservation of public access to, travel within, and enjoyment and appreciation of the open air, outdoor areas, and historic resources of the nation, unquote. Missourians were instrumental in getting the Trail of Tears Association organized with its nine state members. In fact, the Trail of Tears Association is a Missouri registered nonprofit. Today, the main office is in Weber's Falls, Oklahoma. The Trail of Tears Association is a volunteer group supporting the MPS in carrying out the congressional mandates for the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. To find and mark the actual trail, to find the assets of the trail, not just physical, but also stories and facts along the trail, to then interpret those things accurately to engender stewardship of the trail. For the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail, this is done in pursuit of the truth of the tribe, the trail, the tragedy, and the triumph of the Cherokee Nation, and to represent the removal of the other four civilized tribes of the southeastern United States, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creeks, and Seminoles. This is a slide of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail in Missouri, the longest on the trail, ours being 600 miles in length. There are three named routes in Missouri, three unique paths that were followed on the forced removal. The blue arrow points to the Binge route, the green arrow to the Hildebrand route, and the red arrow points to the northern route, which we will focus on tonight. The Cherokee Nation had 17,000 citizens before the forced removal from Georgia and Tennessee and other southeastern states. 4,000 Cherokee died as a result of the forced removal. Today, the nation is nearly 400,000 strong, with its government centered in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. As our executive director, Troy Wayne Petit, says, quote, the Cherokee Nation is not just a footnote in history of the United States. We are a living, breathing, functioning, and contributing people today." Unquote. If you are interested in the Cherokee story, you should visit the new Cherokee National History Museum and the Cherokee Heritage Center, both in Tahlequah. The Heritage Center houses the Cherokee Family Research Center for those of you interested in finding your Cherokee roots. The professional genealogists at the research center were very interested in my great-grandmother's clothing, noting that this being a wedding picture, if she was a Native American, the tattered decorative braided piece around her neck could have been her father's ceremonial family belt, and the three-dimensional figure worn in her hair 
could have been a finger woven spirit figure. So, is she Cherokee? Now on with the Missouri story of the Trail of Tears. In the fall of 1837, Lieutenant B.B. Cannon led the first overland detachment of 365 Cherokee, hundreds of horses and 20 wagons on what became known as the Northern Route of the Trail of Tears. Eventually, 11,000 Cherokee from 11 detachments walked this route over the next two years. Cannon chose this route for several reasons. The two most important were that the traditional shorter route to the west across Arkansas was blocked by the results of the New Madrid earthquake. This 1826 Anthony Finley map will be instructive here. For 100 years before the earthquake, the Trans-Mississippi route crossed the river at the 4th Chickasaw Bluff, now the location of Memphis, leading to the rich St. Francis River floodplain in Arkansas. In fact, Cherokee had been voluntarily moving there since 1792. But the earthquake had turned that 80 mile wide region into an impenetrable swamp, the Great Swamp, as shown on this map at the Blue Arrows. Also note on this map the 1817 Cherokee Line, a line drawn from Point Remove on the Arkansas River to Batesville on the White River at the Yellow Arrows. Those Cherokees living in the St. Francis River Basin at the time of the quake formally moved west of that line to their new reserved land after the 1817 treaty. They, that 1817 treaty was the first Cherokee treaty with the United States that traded land in the west for the same amount of their homeland in the east that they gave up. The treaty reserved that land for Cherokees as written inside the orange circle. This treaty was the impetus for my ancestors settlement in Missouri as this treaty focused on the Lincoln County, Tennessee region. Remember that my great-great-grandmother's sisters married Cherokee men living there. Apparently those mixed marriages were not welcome in Tennessee after that treaty, but accepted unreservedly in frontier Missouri. To today, my great-great-grandparents farm in what is today Lawrence County is the Missouri Department of Conservation's Talbot Conservation Area, where upland land use changes are studied for water quality and wildlife habitat. Their homestead's freshwater spring still flows to fill a beautiful lake on that prairie. Back to our Missouri story. Cannon chose to take a route through Missouri instead of Arkansas because of the destruction of the St. Francis floodplain, and then secondarily because of the roads in Missouri, which in 1837 frontier Missouri were rudimentary at best. The detachment wagons had to have roads to travel on. But what about food for the travelers and their horses and other essential supplies? and camping locations with food and firewood for warmth and cooking. The Mississippi and Missouri rivers had attracted settlement in the early 1700s, mostly French fur and lead mining interest. Both of these created needs for the earliest roads into Missouri. As the French limited their settlements to riverine regions, the roads they developed penetrated into Missouri's interior toward their mines and trapping areas with no interconnection in the interior. They simply went into the mines and back to their settlements on the same roads. No thickening of settlement inward from the French settlements occurred. Spanish authorities had control of the Missouri region after 1763, and by 1800, the Spanish had grave concerns that the British had their eyes on the region, potentially for conquest. So the Spanish government began offering land grants to Americans, knowing the American farmers would aggressively resist British assault. The river bottom lands were already occupied by French settlements and farms, but the inland in uplands had been left untouched, just waiting to be opened for farming. That was exactly the intention of those Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia, Scott Irish, and English American farmers, as their lands had become less productive with use and less available because of crowding. They found large upland limestone-based basins sparsely covered with deciduous trees, mostly oaks. These basins on the Farmington Plain in the Bellevue Valley had thick layers of alpha soils developed over the millenniums from the leaf litter of these open forest regions, the alpha soil being as productive as the river bottom soils but in locations that did not flood and that did not have the diseases like malaria endemic to the lowlands. And these farmers came to make a profit from farming, not as subsistence farmers. Many brought their own large families. Many also brought enslaved farm workers. So across these basins, the plantation system that developed was one of self, first self-sufficiency and second, to produce an excess of farm produce for sale. These were commercial farmers fully intending to produce valuable crops above and beyond what they needed to feed their families and farm workers. 
They needed roads between the farms and onto the next rich basin to move and market their cash crops and to bring back to their farms those essentials they could not produce for themselves. Crops like tobacco and hemp and cotton were then typical southeast Missouri cash crops. To move their farm produce efficiently, they developed roads in the uplands across which wagons could travel. Those roads leading to marketing locations like the small communities and other plantation farms within the basin and beyond through whatever challenging topography to the next productive basin or trade location. This was the road system that was needed to move large numbers of wagons, horses, and people across the early Missouri landscape. And Lieutenant Cannon figured that out. If he couldn't go across Arkansas to Indian Territory, then, have to go, then he would have to go around the Ozark Mountains on these wagon roads of the commercial farmers. So he picked a route from the Cherokee homeland that went northwesterly, including having to cross the Ohio River and, of course, the Mississippi, crossing from Illinois at Bainbridge Ferry, immediately falling onto this system of the earliest Missouri roads. And this helped accomplish the second requirement, food for the Cherokees and their horses and their livestock. These plantation farmers had to have food supplies and reserves to meet the needs of their large families and enslaved farm workers. But would that supply be in excess enough along the length of the trail so that Cannon could buy food sufficient for his detachment? The Cannon detachment left the agency on October 13, 1837. The detachment crossed the Cumberland River on a toll bridge at Nashville on October 27th. They crossed the Ohio at Barry's Ferry Landing at Golconda, Illinois on November the 6th. The detachment passed through Jonesboro, Illinois on November 11th, 1837 and encamped at Clear Creek in the Mississippi River bottom. Three days were required to make the Mississippi River crossing as windy conditions made the crossing too dangerous. Sickness in the detachment had been increasing, but some Trail of Tears researchers have suggested that the use of the water in the sloughs and backwaters from the Mississippi River on the Illinois side was the source of increasingly more illness in the detachment. The detachment passed the county courthouse in Jackson, Missouri on November 16th and headed for Farmington on the old Jackson Road. Cannon recorded in his journal that night that the detachment had, quote, passed through Jackson, Missouri, halted and encamped at Widow Roberts on the road to Farmington, unquote. Note that this was a well-established commercial road across this upland plain. Also note that it passes through the southern third of section 14 on this plat. It is the Trail of Tears. On November 19th, Cannon purchased 470 pounds of salt pork, 156 pounds of bacon, 457 pounds of fresh beef, and seven bushels of corn meal from Zeno T. Blanks. Zeno was a second generation member of the Perrin family, which had been attracted, recruited, to the Missouri in 1800 by Nathaniel Cook to farm his large Spanish land grant on the St. Francis Upland Plain. Having been born in 1804 in Crab Orchard, Kentucky, and following the death of his father in 1808, Zeno with his mother followed her brother and other family who had migrated to Cook Settlement before 1803. By 1837, Zeno had achieved competency in plantation farming with large land holdings along the old Jackson Road just outside of Libertyville in section 14. This slide shows the land holdings of Zeno's relatives across this township. All of these individuals are related to the Perrin family from Crab Orchard and Cook Settlement. They were on site in Missouri before the General Land Office Survey in 1821 and had been able to put their names on these land parcels in this highly productive upland by preemption after the 1816 preemption law was passed. Then the parcels were purchased from the U.S. government in the year shown on the, on the parcel by the individual who held the preemption. The land could not be purchased until it had been surveyed and not then until the preemption had been released, if being purchased by anyone other than the individual who held the preemption. Preemptions like deeds could be sold or traded. Cannon was able to make sufficient purchases over the next few days to meet the needs of the detachment. The first challenging topography he encountered was the St. Francis Mountains, west of Farmington. This image was created by stitching together the needed portions of four USGS topographic quadrant maps. Cannon led the detachment along the valley roads through the mountains, camping one night at a tributary to the St. Francis River, now called Indian Creek. Indian Creek was the drainage between Stone Mountain and Pine Mountain. The detachment had camped along the old Jackson Road the night before, Wolf Creek being the water source. 
It was a requirement that a quality water source be available at the campsites. The Indian Creek Crossing became a standard camping site over the next two years of the forced removal, apparently enough so that the moniker Indian Creek came into common usage and continues today. The detachment passed between Burford Mountain and Iron Mountain, exiting the mountains and entering the next upland basin, the Bellevue Valley. Here again, the Trail of Tears is easily found running along the creek at the base of Burford Mountain. This map better shows the amazing topography of the St. Francis Mountains. It also shows the National Park Service's official Trail of Tears National Historic Trail shown as the red line. This study by the Missouri chapter caused NPS to change the trail route. The blue line is now the Trail of Tears through the St. Francis Mountains. On the evening of November 21st, the detachment passed through Caledonia at the Red Arrow and set up camp on Goose Creek where Cannon bought 405 pounds of bacon as recorded in his invoices from James Evans at the Blue Arrows, a plantation owner in the rich Bellevue Valley. Now what are the chances that any farmer in Missouri in 1837 would have an extra 405 pounds of bacon? Cannon recorded in his diary that night that the detachment had passed through Caledonia and camped where he, quote, issued corn and fodder, beef and bacon, mostly bacon, 14 miles today, unquote. James Evans' land holdings were indicated by the Blue Arrows. Note that Weber Road, another well-established commercial road, leads straight west out of Caledonia through Evans' land, indicating by the, indicated by the yellow arrow. It is the Trail of Tears. After leaving the Bellevue Valley the next day, the road system becomes chaotic, as shown by the large green arrow, and is seen generally across the next several townships to the west. They face 30 miles of difficult travel through the Cotaway Hills region of Missouri, an area rich in lead mines known as Cotaway Diggins, contains some of the most highly dissected topography in the Missouri Ozarks, and an area crisscrossed with multiple roads, as shown in this slide of the next township. Each road had its pluses and minuses for dealing with the difficult terrain. At this point on the trail, Cannon's eye was on the next three camps, each an oasis in the hills where he knew he could buy sufficient food to feed his dependents. But which set of roads would lead to them the best? So you see, this was a region of mining and subsistence farming mostly, potentially hunger for the detachment. As it was a challenge for Cannon to pick his trail, it has been a challenge for us today to find the Trail of Tears. I have referred to two written records that we use to help us find the actual trail. Cannon's journal and Cannon's invoices showing the disbursements for supplies. This was a military expedition, so the money had to be accounted for. The invoices detail the name of the payee, the date, the amount, and the location as best possible. As you have seen, these records give us important landmarks to locate the trail through the rich basins. But we have found that the complexity of the terrain across the Cordaway Hills region could not be defined sufficiently by Cannon's result records for us to find and mark the trail. One might think that the names of the supplier farmers given in Cannon's records that the trail could be defined. However, in this environment of multiple roads in which landowner farmers have multiple land holdings, many times in multiple townships, the actual path of the trail has not been defined. Fortuitously, I found this 1837 Trail of uh, State Road Survey in the Missouri State Archives, apparently never recognized by a Trail of Tears researcher. Seen here with the survey is Dolores Gray Wood, our Missouri chapter president. The road survey is extremely accurate with the survey information recorded at each mile along its course. The surveyor did not lay out a new road. Instead, his job was to select the best set of existing roads to link together to make the best state road from St. Genevieve to Caledonia and on from Caledonia to Massey Ironworks at Merrimack Spring. You see, Merrimack Ironworks at Merrimack Spring was the center of industry in Missouri at that time, producing hundreds of thousands of tons of iron every year. Before the ironworks at Merrimack Spring, Finished iron products like horseshoes, nails, or farm implements were very expensive on the Missouri frontier, even in the river cities of St. Genevieve and St. Louis, because of transportation costs from the supply sources in the east. Producing the iron within the state greatly reduced the cost of iron and finished iron products like plowshares 
and really all metal parts. The arrival of the Iron Age on, on frontier Missouri was essential to the rapid advancement of the region. I also believe there was politics involved in the enactment of this road survey by the Missouri General Assembly. Moses Austin at Potosi had developed his competing river port with a shop tower at Herculaneum. This new state road creating a new, I'm sorry, this new state road survey creating a new state road would have helped St. Genevieve regain some of its lost business as it was originally a very large and wealthy city before losing trade to Herculaneum 10 years before. As, was wrote, as the survey led westward, the surveyor recorded the name and location along the road of each landowner through which the road passed. Each landowner was required to sign a relinquishment to the state for the 60 foot wide path the road followed through his property. The, sur the survey field work was done during the fall of 1837, contemporaneously with the cannon detachments. Amazingly, the names and locations recorded on this road survey correlate with similar information from Cannon's records. The same names of people and places appear on both data sets. We are also using township plats that show the original owners, the date of the purchase, and the date of the purchase of nearly all the parcels of land owned within the Cotaway Hills region of Washington and Crawford counties. We are using these plats with the permission of the publisher, the Arfax Publishing Company, which calls this series of plats family maps. Being able to place the road accurately on township plats across the 30 mile Cotaway Hills region that show all of the contemporaneous landowners has allowed us to locate not just the landowners on the road, but also the suppliers who did not live on the road. I have used digit digitization and GIS georeferencing to define the Trail of Tears path and to find and interpret the assets and human interactions that occurred along the true path of the Trail of Tears in Missouri. It was truly a tragedy that should have never happened. Surely the stewardship of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail confirms in each of us to forever first and foremost tell the truth of the tribe, the trail, and every facet of that tragedy. But this new information about the Trail of Tears in Missouri discloses a new and enduring Missouri story about the earliest American settlers to the region. Their settlement patterns based on their evaluation of the productivity of the soil or on their schemes to make a living extracting Missouri's many natural resources in ways other than agriculture. And about the fragile nature of Missouri's natural communities when faced with those dramatic land use changes. Your ancestors may have supplied the 11 detachments of Cherokees with food. With this GIS te technology, you may find that the Trail of Tears crossed your present farm. I have already described the Scott Irish and English Americans' ability to spot and settle on productive land. And I have detailed for you my perception of their willingness to share their hard-earned farming produce, albeit certainly paid a government rate for it. But do you know that those rich limestone basin soils that produce plantation building crops wore out in one or two generations? And today those basins are mostly in fescue for cattle grazing as deciduous forest continually encroaches. And the only reason cattle can graze on fescue on those once productive plantation fields is because they are fertilized with commercial fertilizer. Those of us, live, those of us living in the Ozarks can testify to that. I want to thank Mr. Chris Dunn of Columbia, Missouri for his professional GIS work and GO referencing the road survey made possible by the very de detailed survey data recorded on the face of the road survey. The significance of that georeferencing is that the road survey can be cast or laid down on any georeferenced map base. For example, this slide shows the road survey colored red and black cast correctly within the counties against the National Park Service map of the same reach along the Trail of Tears colored green. The Park Service did not have access to the 1837 road survey and you can see the differences between the trails as spaces between the lines. This map shows the general land office township plats arranged in geo-referenced format with the 1837 road survey cast on those plats. This map shows the road survey cast on a base map of Missouri's digital elevation model. With this map, we can study the trail's path through Missouri's rugged topography. And this slide shows the township family maps arranged in geo-referenced order with the trail platted correctly on them. You will see this map in greater detail shortly. 
Now back to the detachment's travels. On November 22nd, the detachment traveled 13 miles from its camp just west of Caledonia to the first oasis in the Cotaway Hills, John Scott's farm. The path shown on this geo-reference township plat of landowners is confirmed as a trail of tears because when the geo-reference survey is cast on the plat, the path follows through John Scott's land. His name is appropriately located by distance along the road and the detachment camped there. Because of increasing illness, Cannon rested the detachment for another day in hopes that, quote, the health of the families in some degree will some, in some way degree improve. Issued corn and father and beef, weather very cold, unquote. On the 24th of November, Cannon paid John Scott for 56 bushels of corn and 997 bundles of fodder for the detachment's horses. This slide better shows the farmers on the oasis. Scott's neighbor to the south, S.W. Hutzpet, was paid for 698 pounds of fresh beef and 15 bushels of corn. He was also paid for, quote, quarters in subsistence for the driver of the wagon carrying public funds and medicine, unquote. That wagon was always secured away from the detachment for safekeeping of its contents. Note here that the expression fresh beef meant that the animal had been killed within a day or two and processed into usable cuts for consumption. Beef was rarely eaten on the frontier, but was known for being more nutritious than pork and especially healthful in stressful situations. That beef would have been very usable, valuable to the Hutsworth family. It would have provided a lot of valuable nutrition for his family, providing good protein through the cold winter months. Alexander Glenn brought in 24 bushels of cornmeal from his farm two miles west of the camp. Cornmeal was a processed product. The shell corn had to have been ground at a grist mill somewhere in the neighborhood, somewhere in this oasis. William Gillum and John Archard's names appear on, this, on the survey map, and here, as land parcels, the path traces on the geo-reference plat, further confirming the accuracy for this path as the Trail of Tears. As the trail traced northwestward, it crossed into Township 37 North, 1 West. Colonel George Booth's name appears on the survey map and here on this plat, showing the Trail of Tears through his property. You can see that this rendition of the Trail of Tears can, can inform descendants, descendants of Colonel Booth's and nearby landowners that their family's property may be on the trail. On the 24th of November, the detachment marched. It was a military operation. 12 miles stopping at the Hoosaw Creek. Evidence that this path of the trail shown is correct is that the trail passes through John Garrison's property at the appropriate mile marker along the road survey and that the invoices confirm he sold supplies to Cannon. The, quote, considerable sickness prevailing, unquote, that day led Dr. Townsend, the detachment physician, to advise Cannon to suspend the march. This location was the second oasis through Dakota Way. Known as Brickies or Sanders, this was the Hoosaw Creek bottom. On the survey map, the Hoosaw Creek is labeled, quote, Osage Fork of the Dakota Way, unquote. These two families were the very first to settle the area and owned the very best of the lands for several miles along the creek. Especially the Brickies were represented by multiple families spread along miles of the creek. I have counted 14 unique Brickie family units, mostly in Township 37 North Range 2 West. Along with the extended family representing every craft and trade skill, in addition to farming, they also had many enslaved farm laborers. In the middle of the region of poor soil in the Ozarks and the most difficult topography, this family successfully created and operated a plantation for profit. In addition to all of that, many of the Brickety men were involved in church and school leadership in their community and county government in Steelville, 12 miles away. The detachment spent four miserable, terrible cold days at the ford on Hoosaw Creek, indicated here with the Blue Star. Dr. Townsend diagnosed their illness, illnesses as dysentery and cholera. With almost 400 people at the narrow bend on the creek, along with hundreds of horses and under other livestock, there would not have been a safe drink of water within hundreds of yards. On the fourth day, Cannon received permission for the sick to occupy a community schoolhouse two miles further along the trail. As he records in his journal on November 28th, quote, move the detachment two miles further to a spring and schoolhouse, obtain permission 
for as many of the sick to occupy the schoolhouse as could do so. A much better situation for an encampment than on the creek, sickness increasing, unquote. The schoolhouse and spring are shown in section seven, indicated by the blue star. For the next six days, the detachment stayed at the Silas Bricky farm, tending to the 60 Cherokee too sick to be transported. To this day, the schoolhouse location is identified by the fact that there is an abundant freshwater spring nearby. Those six days would have been busy with a bucket brigade transporting fresh water to the campsite as hydration with safe water was about the only treatment for those diseases. Firewood had to be gathered for fires to cook and warm the schoolhouse. Food had to be processed and cooked. Two children and one adult Cherokee died at this location. Coffins were purchased from the Dopkins brothers and Mr. Bunyard while camped at the creek and schoolhouse. Area farmers sold cannon 2,400 pounds of fresh beef and 8,600 pounds of corn. Nearly every Bricky family provided supplies to the detachment. There is an amazing coincidence that occurred at the spring and cool house, schoolhouse. Apparently the detachment was at that location when the surveyors of the new road were surveying that section. The road survey labels that exact mile marker, quote, Indian camps, shown here. We know that this community became a regular and dependable campsite. Two years after the Cannon Detachment was here, was here, Reverend Daniel Buttrick, traveling with the Richard Taylor Detachment, recorded in his journal, quote, Today we pass through a handsome little village called Caledonia. The village is neat and country around delightful. The people also appear to be intelligent and well-bred. Thus far, we are more and more pleased with Missouri, and the very name con conveys delight to our minds. I visited Mr. Taylor to inquire if the detachment thought that under present circumstances they should be obliged to proceed. Therefore, we prepared for an early start. Mrs. B and myself traveled Saturday about 25 miles and put up with, for the Sabbath at the house of Mr. Bricky." Unquote. This slide shows the trailetiers passed through Presley Anderson and Joshua Kenworthy's land, confirming the trail's location as both names appear on the road survey. Additionally, their neighbors Marvin Trask and Samuel Bunyard sold food and supplies to Cannon while the detachment was staying at the schoolhouse. In the Cannon Journal dated December 4, 1837, quote, marched at 9 o'clock a.m., buried George Killian, and left Mr. Wells to bury a wagoneer who died this morning. Scarcely room on the wagons for the sick, halted at Mr. Davis had to move down the creek a mile off the road to get wood for cooking and warmth." Unquote. Davis's parcel shown on this slide is one mile east of Steelville. The path of the Trail of Tears is confirmed here because the detachment camped on Davis's land. Davis's name on the georeference survey road is at this location and Cannon bought supplies from Mr. Davis. That evening J.H. King brought in 55 bushels of cornmeal from his farm two miles north of Davis. That amount of cornmeal weighed approximately 3,300 pounds. If a wagon and team of horses could transport 600 pounds, it would have taken at least five teams and wagons to deliver that product. It would be very unlikely that one farmer would have had that many teams and wagons. This is a slide of the third oasis of support Cannon found in the Cotaway. I believe at this point on the trail, communication among the area farmers well ahead of the detachment's location was helping to meet the food needs of the detachment. Specifically here at Davis's location, one farmer likely did not have 3,300 pounds of cornmeal. It is a perishable product. I believe that several neighbors of King's went together to accumulate and deliver the cornmeal knowing it was a staple food for the Cherokee. It would have required several days to collect that amount of cornmeal and put the logistics together to deliver to the detachment at Davis's. This is another example of caring and concern for the Cherokee mixed with the capitalism of the frontier for-profit farmers. The price was not negotiable. The farmers had to accept the government rate. It was their choice alone to sell or not. On December 5th, Cannon recorded that the detachment, quote, marched at 9 a.m., left two wagoneers at Mr. Davis's sick this morning, halted at the Merrimack River 10 miles today, unquote. 
As you have seen, Canon recorded the distances of travel each day. We can use that information with the mile marks on the road survey to help pinpoint the campsites. That afternoon, the detachment walked past Brinker's cabin, here indicated by the red arrow, where Cannon bought 31 bushels of corn and 373 bundles of fodder for the horses. The consilience of data confirms that the Trail of Tears is correctly located here. Brinker's property is correctly located here on the georeferenced plat and on the georeferenced road survey, and Cannon bought supplies from Brinker. This is a photo of what was left of the Snelson Brinker cabin after an arsonist set it on fire on July 4th, 2017. The cabin was a certified site on the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. Stewardship of the Trail of Tears is becoming more and more about what we know about it than about the physical assets along the trail, as they will all be gone eventually. At the foot of the hill below the cabin, the detachment crossed the Merrimack River at the Steelville Ford, shown here on another category of map resource we can use to find the trail. This is from a 1928 USGS topographic map. The detachment camped that night in that beautiful valley along the Merrimack River owned by Thomas James, a founder of Massey Ironworks. At one time Mr. James owned 11,000 acres of forest, some as far away as Shannon County. It was his inventory of wood to fire the furnaces at his ironworks. That evening Abraham Benton brought in 868 pounds of fresh beef. Obviously this delivery was planned well ahead specifically for the arrival of the detachment. You are likely seeing a pattern. On the morning of December 6, Cannon paid Brinker for quarters and subsistence for the driver of the wagon carrying the specie and medicine. Again, we see that that important wagon was separated from the detachment and well secured away from the detachment. The driver likely stayed in that very cabin in 1837 that was burned to the ground in 2017. This slide will help orient you to the geographic layout of Massey Ironworks and the roadway the Cherokee followed on December 6th. They left their camping area along the Merrimack River at the Blue Area. They walked westward and crossed the Spring Branch coming from the Ironworks at the Yellow Area. Then they turned south along the Spring Branch toward the Ironworks and Merrimack Spring at the Red Arrow. As I begin the description of the trail through Massey Ironworks, it is probably best to show how it was oriented on the comp compass. This very early drawing of Massey Ironworks, found at the archives, does a good job of doing that, but only if you can read upside down. So turning it 180 degrees shows correctly that the spring is to the south. The blue arrow points to the spring branch flowing toward the Merrimack River, and the yellow area points to the mill race created by the rock dam indicated by the red arrow. I want to quickly introduce you to another extremely important road survey found in the Missouri archives. This is a survey of a road that by law had to go from Herman on the Missouri River through Massey Ironworks and on to Shannon County. The Ironworks was the center of Missouri industry for several decades, requiring about 400 employees. The German immigrants to the Missouri River Valley I'm sorry, the German immigration to the Missouri River Valley was in full swing in 1837, centered at Herman. Many of these immigrants were craftsmen and tradesmen with special skills especially useful for the technical needs of the ironworks. So the General Assembly passed this act to help both the ironworks and the immigrant community. On December 6, 1837, the detachment, quote, marched at 9 o'clock a.m. and passed the Massey Ironworks, unquote. The map details the road, the Trail of Tears, through the ironworks, showing the spring branch crossing at the Red Arrow, the walk on the bluff behind the furnaces <clears throat> around the Merrimack Spring, and the road the Cherokee walked, the Blue Arrow. That was the state road to Springfield, shown here, turned 180 degrees so that you can read the surveyor's label. That led them up the final hill of the ironworks and the Cotaway Hills to the beginning of a new landscape at Big Prairie, now the location of St. James. Massey Ironworks is a certified site on the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. Iron products were transported in every direction out of the ironworks. It was not just the center of industrial Missouri, it was the transportation center as well. The newly surveyed date road from Herman to the ironworks became known famously as the Old Iron Road. 
At Herman, the iron was loaded on boats to float to markets in St. Louis and further east. Hundreds of thousands of tons of iron were moved across that road every year for 30 years until the railroad was completed to St. James about 1860. This is the GLO plat that is due north of the ironworks. Before and after 1860, iron products were also transmitted, transported on, quote, the road to Massey Ironworks, unquote, to Big Prairie, where it intersected the St. Louis to Springfield Road. The major travel and trade corridor for decades, including our modern times, as it was the pathway of Route 66 and is now for Interstate 44. On December the 6th, the detachment followed the state road to Springfield northward out of the ironworks and onto the road to Massey Ironworks, written here on this 1833 GLO plat. That road intersected with the Springfield to St. Louis Road in section 17. The green arrow points to the intersection. The orange arrow points to the Springfield to St. Louis Road heading to St. Louis. The yellow area indicating the Springfield direction of that same road. The blue arrow points to the road to Massey Ironworks coming from the southwest. Transferring now to the land parcel map for this township. The road to Massey Ironworks is again indicated by the blue arrow and is traced in yellow heading northwesterly across township 38, 6 west to the intersection with the St. Louis to Springfield Road where the detachment turned southwesterly toward their new home in Indian Territory. Known then as Big Prairie, today the city of St. James is centered on that prairie and is still a major transportation distribution point. That night, the detachment camped about one mile west of the St. Louis to Springfield Road, indicated by the blue arrow at Archibald Jones's farm, indicated by the red arrow, to be near the Burbis River for, water, for a water source. This was the Cherokee's first opportunity to camp and appreciate the wildflowers and tall native grasses on Missouri's treeless prairies so characteristic of the abundant landscapes on the Springfield Plain. Over the previous weeks, they had witnessed and been sustained by the productivity of Missouri's earliest landowners, natural resources, infrastructure, and industry, knowing full well that they were walking a trail of tears toward their new home on a frontier semi-desert. The Trail of Tears at St. James reach, reached its most northern apex, and from there the detachment still faced 24 days of travel over the Springfield Plain before the final muster roll was called on December 30, 1837 in Indian Territory. I believe it is likely that on the Trail of Tears in Missouri, not a single Cherokee traveler even once went to sleep at night hungry. I want to express a sincere thank you to the archives reference staff at the Secretary of State's office in Jefferson City for their professional expertise while helping me with this research for this study. Again, thank you to Mr. Chris Doan for his expert help with the GIS world and to RFAX Publishing for the use of their family maps. Thank you very much.